at the 2009 conference in Bellevue, uh, in, um, uh, Greg Bailey, the editorial director of Reformation Trust, uh, had emailed me ahead, said he wanted to talk. And that's where he asked me to, uh, to contribute to the, uh, the Profiles of Godly Men series that uh, Dr. Lawson is the series editor of. And uh, we honed in on Knox and then later on Watts, which is forthcoming. I love writing because I learn so much as I write. Uh, I count myself among those who write as they learn and learn as they write. One of the things that I've learned about church history is that there are some persistent errors that uh, we just keep coming back to, not just church history, history in general. Probably the one that uh, most broadly we, we uh, err on the side of is uh, not thinking much about it at all, not thinking it's relevant to uh, our lives and not even knowing very much about this. I had this illustrated while I was uh, doing research for The Mighty Weakness of Knox. I decided to park myself in front of Knox's home at Trunk Close uh, on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh and ask locals, Scots, I wanted to talk to the, to the real people, and ask them, uh, you know, was, who was Knox, first of all, and was he good for Scotland? So a buddy of mine, he's here, uh, filmed this, um, and uh, you're not going to believe the first person. I write fiction, so sometimes I have to differentiate. I'm telling the truth right now, not, not <laughs> fiction. But... but um, the first people I went up to, a husband and a wife, and they were standing there, kind of bending over, looking at the sign there at the entrance to Knox's home. And they looked pretty bewildered. And I went up to him and I said, hi, you know, who is John Knox? And uh, was he good for Scotland? And um, the guy reaches in his pocket and pulls out his iPhone and starts looking up Wikipedia. And he says, you know, his wife says to me, we don't know who he is, but we ought to know because our last name's Knox. <laughs> it's on YouTube if you want to see it. That, that's true, actually. But um, everything on YouTube is true, right? Um, another persistent error, and this is the one that was going on in Knox's own day, is uh, that we, we find these heroes and we lionize them and we turn them into idols. And uh, I had this illustrated uh, just a few weeks ago, again, uh, on the Royal Mile. A few uh, steps up the cobbled streets from Knox's home, and you get to St. Giles High Kirk, where Knox preached for 12 years. And as you enter that great church, um, you have one of the great ironies of church history staring you in the face. And that is a stone statue and a bronze statue to the very man who made it his business to tear down the idols of the medieval church, both theologically and literally. And uh, in, the very, in the very place where Knox preached against anything coming between the sinner and Jesus Christ the Savior, they have enshrined Knox. Um, he burst on the stage when that, this was the error. The medieval church took uh, people and they made them into saints and they required you to pray to them, uh, to venerate them, to light candles to them. And um, we tend to do some of the same. We can, we can look for great moral lessons or we can look for great heroic deeds and, and in Knox's life there are both of those in spades. But um, uh, finally Knox was a human guy and he was pretty irascible at times, and he was really ticked off at the three female tyrants that were surrounding him and wanted to end his life. If we wanted to know, if we wanted to know how we should think about church history, how we should think about heroes from the past, can somebody who is, let's say, 16 or under tell me what New Testament book and chapter in that book we would go to? 16 and under. If we were looking for what, how we should think about church history, how we should think about heroes from the past, what book of the Bible and chapter in that book would we go to? We'll go, we'll go up from 16. How about 19 and under? <laughs> Hebrews? Hebrews what? You got it. Come on up here for a book. <clears throat> I see this clock ticking in front of me, so I'm going to do this kind of quickly here. But if you've read Hebrews 11 lately, you know that uh, 
it's, you. you betcha. It's a, uh, it's a long list of some pretty messed up people. Uh, husbands, for example, uh, your wives don't want you to grow up to be, you know, like Abraham, Samson, and King David. And um, wives, when you read your Bible, uh, you don't turn to your husband and say, honey, why can't you be a husband to me like Solomon was to his thousand wives and 750 concubines? <laughs> what is it that the great cloud of witnesses were witness to in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, they were witness to grace. They all needed it in spades. And as Sinclair Ferguson says, grace isn't a thing, it's a person. And uh, at the beginning of chapter 12, we, we, have, we are charged to turn and look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Knox, the great decrier of idolatry, would not be amused with statues erected in his honor by sentimental Victorian romantics, nor would he be pleased if we were to write books and go to conferences and all as an end in themselves about his life. Here's the true measure of greatness in any, uh, in any age, in any uh, prominent figure in church history. Uh, the extent to which they point us away from themselves and to the majesty of Jesus Christ is the extent uh, that they deserve to be considered worthy of our, of our consideration and of our study and of buying a book and reading it on him. Knox does this in wonderful ways for us that start by him being a nobody. Uh, there's no birthday hats or party favors for Knox uh, on his uh, 500th because nobody knows what month and what day of the month he was born. And historians have squabbled about what year he was born for many, many uh, generations. They pretty well settled in on 1514. Um, he was born to obscurity. He didn't have uh, a heraldic symbol. He didn't have any titles after his name. His parents didn't have any wealth. They had no castle. They were nobodies. Knox managed to go to college, to university, but uh, historians are not in agreement whether that was Glasgow or St. Andrews. Probably St. Andrews, but the record isn't clear because Knox didn't finish his college degree. He didn't even go to seminary. He didn't have a designer PhD. In fact, he didn't even have Ligonier to bridge the gap between Sunday school and seminary. You know? <laughs> Poor guy. So how did he become the titan of the Scottish Reformation? How did men who were much more formally educated than Knox step back and see him be the leader of this great movement of God? And Knox tells us uh, himself that it was, it was the grace and the power of God in Christ, period. Like all great men, you strip him of his God-given might and his, the thunder of his calling, and uh, what's left is a, is a small man. Uh, one contemporary said he was low in stature and of a weakly constitution. Uh, in all the ways that matter to the world, Knox was a pretty unimpressive guy. Now, what man in this room is willing to admit that when I said that, you thought, I could have had dessert? You know, why am I sitting here listening to a talk about a guy who's so unimpressive when I could be having cheesecake? What guy's honest enough to admit that? You're looking at the exit signs, your watch. Come on. Okay, wife, you know he was thinking that. Raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody wants a book here? I mean, <laughs> right here. Okay, we got a chump over here who's trying to get out the door. Giles, give him that book. All right, Knox was a nobody, that's where I was. Um, and he was surrounded in life by lots of critics, lots of people who wanted his head on a, on a platter. They were vain, bulging critics. He was denounced by regents, queens, and councils. His effigy was hoisted at the Market Cross in Edinburgh, and it was burned. He was ridiculed as Knox the knave. He was outlawed, forbidden to, to preach. There were hits put out on him, assassination attempts. He was shot at through the window. After his death, 140 years after his death, the uh, English parliament ordered a big pile of his books heaped up and uh, a torch uh, set to those books. When George Whitfield was preaching Great Awakening in 1739, the gospel of grace going out like wildfire in England and in America, he was accused of preaching doctrine borrowed from the Kirk of Knox. He's depicted as a blustering fanatic at his own house museum and in other books. Postmoderns dismiss him as a misogynist. I feel a book coming on here. 
Is there somebody in here who's 14 and under? A girl who can tell me what a misogynist is. How's your Greek? 16 and under. What is a misogynist? Grab a book there, Jillian. Okay, anybody. What's a misogynist? Right there, okay. Jillian, see that hand right over there? Go give her that book. You see her over there? She's waving. Keep waving when, when they're coming here. Um, a misogynist is a, a woman hater, a hater of women. I'm going to say more about that in a moment here. But in 1972, when Knox was 400, uh, his uh, 400th anniversary of his death, that is, all Scotland decided that he was an inappropriate subject to commemorate on a Scottish postage stamp. And that kind of as a crowning blow, the um, Edinburgh Town Council decided that they were going to remove the pretty small stone marker anyway that was on his grave, and they were going to pave a parking lot on the north side of St. Giles. As of April, he lies at rest under stall 23. <laughs> you might need to know that if you go to Edinburgh. And there is no recognizable label on stall 23 uh, that John Knox lies there. With the exception of the, romantic, uh, of the romanticized statues uh, in St. Giles, there's much more to be said about that, uh, Knox has been largely either forgotten or just simply vilified, misrepresented by history. So why, is it, why do we think it might be worthy of our consideration here at a conference? Well, I think it's because, because Knox is so much like so many of the rest of us. He's weak, tired, timid, undereducated, often sickly, obscure, not well-networked, and if he were running for office, he would be wholly unelectable, I'm sure. Knox is a model of how God, by his grace and power, raises up ordinary folks to be the mighty agents of his spirit's power to do mighty things. Hence the title of the book, The Mighty Weakness of Knox. You can go ahead and just take that pile down there, okay? You can sit down there on the steps. Um, St. Giles, High Kirk, Edinburgh. We named Giles after a building in Scotland. My wife hates it when I say that. But um, I'd like to take you for a quick moment to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Paul seemed to know something about weakness that you and I are hell-bent on forgetting. For the sake of Christ, Paul said, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness, but so forgetful are you and I of this fact that we need the kind of reminder that Knox, Knox life, small, timid Knox, uh, provides for us every day. His contemporary Thomas Smeaton at Knox's funeral when he was being buried said, I know not if God ever placed a more godly and great spirit in a body so little and frail. We tend to think of Knox as sort of a, you know, sort of a linebacker or something. He wasn't. He was small, undersized, didn't feel good a lot of the time. Rather than give you a historical overview of Knox's life, I'd like to take the next few minutes that we have together to uh, try to feature a few highlights, as time permits, of his ministry. What do we think of Knox? When you think of Knox, what do you think of him doing? Who said that? Raise your hand. Giles, get a book to her. Right over there. Or Jillian. There we go. All right. He's uh, thought of as a preacher. Thundering Scott. Um, and he was, but um, he wasn't by DNA wired for oratory. This wasn't a guy who uh, looked for the limelight. He wasn't like my son Giles in after family worship who mounts the hearth and tries to imitate R.C. Sproul preaching to the family in the evening. It wasn't, wasn't like that. Um, when he was first called to preach, he declined. And uh, when he was pressed, I'm quoting here, he burst forth in most abundant tears and fled the room. Well, much later, having learned to preach uh, in, in large part under Calvin's influence, he wrote none of his sermons down, and uh, so we, we only have two complete sermons for the thundering Scott known for being a preacher. Um, uh, we have notes that he uh, took, and we have notes that lots of listeners uh, took, and by all accounts, he was a pretty animated preacher and apparently splintered more than one pulpit in his zeal. But... To his flock, Knox was a very gentle pastor. Uh, I read many letters and uh, more intimate writings of Knox in preparation for the story, and I was amazed at his tender shepherd's heart for his flock. 
he could thunder. And he unleashed his thunder, though, on tyrants and on the elite who used their power to oppress the poor and to keep them uneducated by erecting idols in place of Jesus Christ. And this really got Knox worked up. Knox, as a preacher, was relentlessly single-minded. It was said of his preaching, he showed the great love of God for his church and how the true church hears the voice of its own true pastor, Jesus Christ. O oh, Lord eternal, Knox prayed before entering the pulpit, move and govern my tongue to speak the truth. And a central truth that Knox preached was that popery had revived the kingdom of the law and that God, by his grace through the Reformation, was reviving the kingdom of grace. Knox was on fire about the free grace of the gospel. Anything that came between the sinner and Christ for Knox was an idol. And in his preaching, he made it his business to tear down those idols and show his hearers the surpassing splendor of Jesus Christ. He preached in England after 19 months as a galley slave. You can read more about that in the biography, and if you want, in my novel on Knox, The Thunder, that's coming out uh, this month. Uh, and... Um, he preached before Edward VI uh, a number of times, Westminster Abbey, Hampton Court, and St. George's Chapel, uh, Windsor, Cha Windsor, Windsor Castle. But he preached with and uh, was in league with uh, uh, some of the great English reformers, Hugh Latimer, foremost among them. Uh, they called Latimer the Knox of England, in fact. He was offered the most, uh, Calvin, or Knox was offered the most influential pulpit in London. He turned it down. He was offered a bishopric. Nah, wasn't interested in being a bishop. Eventually, he was called and uh, appointed, really, by the English church to the most unprestigious pulpit in the realm, arguably. It was a backwater, uh, border, garrison town, a poor, undereducated community, rough gambling, hard drinking town. It was Berwick on Tweed. And uh, Berwick on Tweed was a rough place. Knox took up his ministry there with zeal and with enthusiasm. Uh, he took up his charge publicly to preach the gospel, he said, of Jesus Christ and to feed the flock which he hath redeemed with his own blood and has commended the same to the care of all true pastors. When Edward VI died, young, 15, um, Mary Tudor, Mary I, Bloody Mary, she's known as, came to the throne with a vengeance and she wanted Knox's head and lots of other heads uh, to roll. And um, many of his friends urged him to flee and take refuge in Calvin's Geneva. Knox did. He later called it the most perfect school of Christ since the days of the apostles. There he worked on the Geneva Bible. He contributed to the 300,000 uh, commentary notes that were attached to the Geneva Bible. But he always felt this pull back to Scotland. I feel a sob and a groan, he said, willing that Christ Jesus might openly be preached in my native country, although it should be with the loss of my wretched life. Well, in 1555, the height of the persecution, this is when Ridley, Latimer, Cramner, the bishop martyrs were being burned at the stake in Oxford. Nobles in Scotland sent a letter to Knox and urged him to come back and preach. They needed Knox to come preach to them. The Queen Regent, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots' mother, there's a lot of Marys here, but Mary, Queen of Scots' mother, hated Knox, wanted to turn Scotland over to French, the French and to Catholicism. Knox comes back in 1555 and nothing short of a commando crusade, staying one step ahead of not one but two Marys that wanted to burn him. And um, uh, there was another reason he came back. One of his first converts at Berwick-on-Tweed was... Marjorie Bowes, and he came back to get married to her in 1555. And what woman in this room is willing to admit that when you heard that, you thought, oh, just stop right there and tell me more about that. I'd like to hear a lot more about it right there. Okay, keep your hand up right over there. Jillian, can you take that book right back there? Um, glad there's honest people at Ligonier conferences. But uh, you'll have to read more about that because I'm not going to say anything more about that. But anyway, he went back to Geneva. It's a great story. But um, went back to Geneva, then comes back permanently to Scotland in 1559. And uh, the Queen Regent really is not happy about this. And um, she's determined to kill him. 
Uh, she orders her French army out to follow Knox around and uh, fire on uh, congregations he had preached in. Knox keeps preaching. He's feeble in health all the time. These guys, most of these guys in church history did not feel so good. He had kidney stones, insomnia, fever, parasites. When you and I don't feel well, we don't do very well. But Knox didn't feel uh, very good at all any of the time. And then he's surrounded by uh, the French army. He's surrounded by assassins hired by the Queen Regent. The intel was in. They wanted to kill him, period. This is what Knox said. He was determined to preach Christ. He said, I cannot in good conscience delay preaching tomorrow. If I am not detained by violence, as for fear of danger to my person, my life is in the hand of him whose glory I seek, and therefore I fear not their threats. I desire the hand and weapon of no man to defend me. But weak Knox, with the unction and power of the Spirit, fearlessly preached the gospel, and thousands were converted to faith in Christ. We wonder, in a world of hype, how Knox did it without PowerPoint. <laughs> it's astonishing. What did he preach? How did he do it? Well, Knox's explanation was a simple one. By God's grace, I declare Jesus Christ, the strength of his death, and the power of his resurrection. We tend to doubt the potency and efficacy of the gospel. And so we try to add to it or take away from it or doll it up, fix it up, repackage it in some way, or we, still more perniciously, will try to sophisticate it, make it less foolish. We want Christianity with snob appeal sometimes. Knox didn't know anything about that. Dazzled by God's grace in the gospel, Knox declared Jesus Christ, the strength of his death and the power of his resurrection. And perhaps never before in one country in so short a period of time were so many people converted to faith in Christ. Calvin wrote to Knox, now his good friend, uh, of, of the rapid spread of the gospel that he'd heard about back in Geneva. He said, as we are astonished at such incredible progress in so brief a space of time, so we likewise give thanks to God whose singular blessing is signally displayed herein. Knox kept the main thing, the main thing in his preaching, and that was Jesus Christ. And as a preacher, Knox wanted his hearers to check up on him, to be equipped to check up on him. He knew our relentless tendency to tamper with the gospel, to default to law-keeping and good works, add a little bit of performance in there, to dilute the pure doctrine of the free grace of the gospel with, with our efforts. Since they were to be taught and pastored, as Knox put it, by men, not by angels, Knox instituted uh, universal literacy in Scotland, establishing the first national education system in the Western world. The Geneva Bible and Calvin's uh, catechism were the starting blocks of the uh, curriculum. And it was for girls, too. Does that sound like a misogynist to you, by the way? <laughs> I mean, girls in Scotland today wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to read if it wasn't for John Knox. Doesn't sound like that to me at all. If we have time, we don't really. But what young lady in this room can tell me what you're going to tell somebody next time they say that John Knox was a misogynist? Ask him a question. What would you say? I picked a bad time to fix her hair there. <laughs> what adult? Anybody? What would you say? He was not. He was not. Okay, that's good. Give that lady a book. That's good. <laughs> He was not. Knox was not. Um, all right. Um, well, get the implication of what Knox was saying here and what he was doing here by uh, universal literacy. He wanted everybody to be able to believe, read the Bible. They, he knew that the pastors of these churches that he was training, he knew himself. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't always going to get it right. He wanted to create an entire country of Bereans. Bibles open on their laps checking up on him, checking to see that he doesn't deviate a whisker from the, the purity of the gospel. We need to recover that way of listening to sermons uh, today. He was a great preacher, a great pastor, but critics called him the enfant terrible of Calvinism. And um, he had studied under Calvin, and Knox was an unapologetic preacher of the doctrine of predestination. Uh, Knox doesn't leave anything like the literary output of Calvin, 47 volumes from Calvin. Knox gave us six, but fully one-fifth of the page count of those six is given over to a carefully reasoned biblical explanation of the doctrine of predestination, and he never strayed far from it in his preaching. Now, I want you to get this. Forget everything else I said. Don't forget this. It is hugely significant. 
that the great evangelist, the great preacher of the gospel of Scotland, of arguably the most widespread revival uh, in any place in history, uh, was a unabashed preacher of the doctrine of predestination. Sadly, Wesley's and Finney and many of their stepchildren don't get this, and we Reformed Christians sometimes don't too. We get tired of our own theology. We grow weary of our distinctives. We start looking for something else more intellectually stimulating. We've got that one wired. We yawn at the doctrines of grace and the gospel. How can we possibly do that? But for Knox, grounding his gospel preaching in the unmerited, unconditional, electing love of the Father for his chosen ones was not an option Once again, Knox helps awaken this generation to the bedrock truth of the gospel and to stand firm in it. Knox, uh, Timorous Knox knew uh, how much he needed the grace of God in predestination for his own salvation and so for his hearers. He never flinched from from preaching the doctrine, nor did he minimize its importance when challenged to defend it. But for Knox, it wasn't a theological club with which to smash his adversaries, nor was it an intellectual exercise like it is for us sometimes to intimidate the unenlightened. They just don't get it. No, it was the doctrine on which all the other doctrines of the grace of the gospel got their traction. Enemies of free grace in Knox's day, he said, most furiously raged against that doctrine which attributeth all praise and glory of our redemption to the eternal love and undeserved grace of God alone. And they rage on today in our own circles, in our own camps, uh, even. Knox, doctrine of predestination was not the tofu version. It was not, uh, it was not the conditional uh, election, the covenantal predestination that you can forfeit by your unfaithfulness. Knox wouldn't have understood that at all. It was the red meat, black coffee Calvinism, the grace of God that actually worked was what Knox preached. It actually saved the sinner dead in his trespasses who can only be made alive by the sovereign electing love of God. For Knox, predestination was the theological rebar that gave unshakable strength to the saving work of God in Christ. Knox argued that if we are to be truly humble, if we are to, quote, be ravished in admiration of God's goodness and so moved to praise, we must know and believe the doctrine of eternal predestination For Knox, if one wants the gospel and true worship of God, eternal predestination is not an optional doctrine. It's a necessary one. For Knox, predestination is necessary for many reasons, but one is for building up the faith of the weak and timorous, for giving unshakable assurance of salvation to the Christian. He said it this way, there is no way more proper to build and establish faith than when we hear and undoubtedly do believe that our election consisteth not in ourselves, but in the eternal and immutable good pleasure of God, and that in such firmity that it cannot be overthrown, neither by the raging storms of the world, nor by the assaults of Satan, neither yet, get this now, neither yet by the wavering and weakness of our own flesh. Then only is our salvation in assurance when we find the cause of the same in the bosom and counsel of God. Well, critics of predestination uh, often raise questions, you know, uh, why pray if God's predestinated everything? Knox was an earnest man of prayer. I'm going to abbreviate this real quickly because that clock is ticking. Uh, Knox knew that it was the Almighty alone who could save sinners. They couldn't save themselves, so he prayed to the Almighty for the salvation of sinners. He, one of his favorite salvos was, one man with God is always in the majority, And uh, Knox didn't worry over much about French armies and assassins and all. In fact, I think he probably worried for them. He was more fearful for them because he had God on his side. Um, Bring on the armies. You know, he didn't didn't care. Knox's friends and supporters appreciated the wide-ranging effect of Knox in his earnest and familiar talking with God as he termed prayer. His ardent enemy, the Queen Regent, said that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than an army of 10,000 men. When John Knox went upstairs to plead with God for Scotland, C.H. Spurgeon said, it was the greatest event in Scottish history. Prayer was the engine that advanced Reformation in Scotland, and Knox knew it, and so he was the foremost prayer warrior in the realm. Well, in conclusion, for the sake of Christ, Paul said, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. By the way, that's a summary not only of Paul's life, but of Knox's life. For when I am weak, 
then am I strong. You and I see weakness as a liability. Knox saw it as his great strength because he could turn from himself. This is what the gospel is. We flee, we abandon all hope in ourselves and we flee to the merit and the, the perfections and the righteousness, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ uh, alone. Knox summed up the whole Scottish Reformation. God gave his Holy Spirit to simple men in great abundance. Let me uh, conclude just with uh, words from Knox at a conference on standing firm. Let's hear it straight from Knox himself. Stand with Christ Jesus, Knox said, in this day of his battle, which shall be short and the victory everlasting. For the Lord himself shall come in our defense with his mighty power. He shall give us the victory when the battle is most strong. Amen.